In this video, I'm going to build a wireless power system that uses a rapidly changing magnetic field to power things from up to two feet away. To understand how wireless power transfer works, first we need to understand how a transformer works. A transformer has a primary or input winding and a secondary winding, which is the output. Alternating current travels through the primary, which creates an alternating magnetic field. The alternating field travels through a ferromagnetic core, which acts as a very efficient conductor of magnetic flux. When the flux hits the secondary, it induces a voltage, which causes current to flow when it's connected to a load. The voltage induced is proportional to the number of turns on the secondary and the time rate of change of the magnetic flux it's exposed to. In a transformer with a closed ferromagnetic core, the coupling coefficient K is at least 0.9 meaning at least 90% of the flux is traveling from the primary into the secondary. In a good transformer, K is very close to 1. However, the transformer can be built without a core, and this is known as an air core transformer. These don't perform as well as a core transformer, though, and their coupling coefficient is usually less than 0.6. This is because instead of having a highly permeable core to travel through, a lot of the magnetic flux simply flies out into space and isn't caught by the secondary meaning it's basically wasted energy. In an even more extreme case, the secondary can be far away from the primary and still collect power from it, but in this case the coupling coefficient is less than 10%, and the overwhelming majority of the magnetic flux simply leaks out into space. However, if the primary is putting out a lot of power, that small coupling coefficient can still be enough to generate useful power from a distance. For my wireless power system, I'm going to do this with single loops of copper tubing instead of coils with many windings. However, a single loop of wire has a very low inductance, so I'll have to run my primary at tens of kilohertz to avoid blowing it up with too much current. I'm not that interested in producing a ton of power, but rather want to see how far away I can make a wireless power transmitter work. So I looked up the formula for a magnetic field versus distance from a loop of wire and plugged it into Excel to do some optimization. The particular circuit I simulated produced an AC amplitude of 44 amps, so I used that value and plotted the magnetic field strength in gauss versus distance for several loop diameters. As you can see, at close range the smallest diameter yields the best results, but its efficiency drops off rapidly with distance. As we move to larger diameters, we get less effect at close range, but the efficiency drop as we get farther away happens much slower. The takeaway here is that a larger diameter loop will be a better choice if we're aiming to operate at a long distance. In my case, I'm going to use a diameter of 15 inches, and my loop will be built out of quarter inch copper tubing used for plumbing. The circuit is a ZVS driver, just like I've used in previous videos, but this time I'm using IRF640 MOSFETs, which can handle up to 200 volts, meaning I could theoretically put around 48 volts into the circuit. I've also changed the diodes to MUR120s, which can handle 200 volts and have a recovery time of 75 nanoseconds, meaning they'll be able to handle the high frequency of this circuit, which is just shy of 90 kilohertz. So here's that circuit built on a piece of perf board, and I'm just going to solder it up to my transmitter loop. To make the loop stand upright, I designed and 3D printed some feet for it, which will connect to the loop with zip ties. After that, I mounted everything on a piece of plywood I had laying around from an earlier project. My capacitor bank was overheating when I test ran the board, so I built a larger one with 30 100 nanofarad caps in parallel on a separate board to get the 3 microfarads I needed. Then I put together the receiver and connected its terminals to my oscilloscope for a quick test. As you can clearly see, moving the receiver toward the transmitter increases the voltage across it, and moving away reduces the voltage, so it looks like everything's working. Here's a closer look at the receiver voltage. The farthest away I'm getting is about 4 feet, and the closest is about 6 inches. To make the receiver work even better, I added some capacitors in parallel to make it resonate. The receiver loop is identical to the transmitter loop, so the receiver capacitance is also 3 microfarads. Let's look at the output on the scope again. My peak-to-peak -peak voltage was about 20 volts before, but with the resonant capacitors in the circuit, it now goes well over 50. But this is an open circuit measurement. Let's see how well it holds up when I put a load on it. I added an 18.7 ohm dummy load to the receiver and measured it on the scope again. The peak to peak voltage maxed out at about 41, and I could actually feel the resistors getting warm. 
Okay, great, but how does that compare with a non-resonant circuit? Let's see. Here's the receiver output with the resonant capacitors removed. The maximum peak-to-peak -peak is 8.6 volts compared to 41 volts previously. That's almost a 5-fold drop in voltage and a 25-fold power reduction. To power DC loads, I built a rectifier for the receiver. High frequency alternating current comes in through the loop and oscillates in the LC circuit. The bridge rectifier is built from four high-speed diodes and moves the AC voltage up above the zero line. Then, a large capacitor smooths out the voltage peak, giving a steady DC voltage. The first DC load I wanted to try was a brushed motor, so I designed this 3.5 inch diameter prop and made it on my 3D printer. I eventually want to fly a drone with wireless power, so maybe this would provide me with a little bit of insight. Even though this was a tiny motor with a propeller that was nowhere near optimal, it generated a surprising amount of thrust connected to the receiver and I could actually feel it pulling on my hand just a little bit. The next thing I wanted to try was charging a tablet from a distance. To do this, I took apart a car charger and connected the input pins to the receiver's rectifier. At a distance of 18 inches, the charger came to life when I cranked up the transmitter to about 14 volts. I tried to push the transmitter to 24 volts, but the ZVS driver went into latch up, which is when both MOSFETs get stuck in the on state. This is something I'll have to correct in future designs. Next, I hooked up different load resistors to the rectifier output and measured the DC voltage across them at various distances. Knowing that V equals IR, I also plotted the DC current after I recorded the voltage. After about 18 and a half ohms, it looks like the voltage didn't really go up much, so this is probably very close to the open circuit voltage of the receiver. Next we have the power versus distance. I got the best power transfer with my 18 and a half ohm load resistor, but my guess is that the best efficiency point is probably somewhere around the 10 ohm mark. There's about 40 watts of input power into the transmitter, meaning the system is around 10% efficient over a distance of one foot, which is quite a bit more than what I expected. The next thing I wanted to try was picking up a magnet with wireless power, so I used some 24 gauge magnet wire I had laying around to make this 2 ohm electromagnet coil. There's no metal core, so it won't attract a magnet until it's energized. I was able to effectively energize the coil from as far as two feet away. Of course, I can't do a wireless power video without powering up some shiny lights, so I made this LED board. Here the loops are 24 inches apart. This demonstration is more dramatic in the dark. One important feature of the wireless power transfer is that the loops need to be parallel with each other. When one is placed perpendicular to the other, no power is transferred. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching.